Welcome to CISS 232, Scripting in the Client Server Environment. Um, I'm going to go over some of the things that are in Canvas. Uh, the rest are up to you to read on your own time. Uh, I do want to make clear the nature of this class because it's not always clear. Uh, this class is a blended class. Uh, specifically, it's, you know, we always got to come up with new buzzwords, right? Specifically, this is called a high flex class. I don't know, high flex sounds like, uh, I don't know, some kind of energy drink or something, but really what high flex means is that you can, uh, you can, you can get the materials in this class several different ways. First way, and there's, there's some people here today is you can show up in person. We have one lecture per week and that is uh, Tuesdays from 9 a.m. to, to 10 a.m in BU 103, all right? So you can attend the lecture in person if you want to. And it doesn't matter, that, I know there was a couple of sections of CISS 232 that you can sign up for. It doesn't matter which section you signed up for, you can do this regardless of the section. So you can show up in person and watch a lecture that way. Uh, you can log on to WebEx and the link to log on to WebEx is in my syllabus. Uh, and you can watch the lecture live. At the moment, there's no one watching the lecture live. Uh, you can also watch a recording of the lecture that will be posted shortly after the class finishes. So you can, that's high flex, highly flexible. All right, so you can, uh, you can watch it live in person, live via WebEx, or asynchronously via the YouTube video. Um, the lab immediately follows this class from 10 to 11 uh, p.m. up in BU to 10, I think, all right? And same rules apply to that. You can show up to lab in person if you want. Uh, you can uh, log on to WebEx and ask me any questions that you have that way as well, all right? Now, I make all my labs available to all my students, which means that let's say, for example, if you're not available today from 10 to 11, but you do have a lab question, you can show up anytime during my office hours, either in person in the lab or online via WebEx. So these are my office hour slash lab time. All right, so you can see 10 to 11 today in BU 210, also 2 to 3 p.m. today in BU 2 to uh, 210. And likewise, 10 to 11 and 2 to 3. The only difference is the Monday 10 to 11 is in BU 102 as opposed to BU 210. <laughs> the aim is to make this as flexible as possible to you because I realize that everyone has their own situation and everyone has their own responsibilities both academically and outside of academics. Uh, for example, you know, uh, I don't know what the weather is going to be like next week, but let's say it's very snowy. All right. It may be possible that you don't feel like driving in the snow. All right. Well, just watch it on WebEx then or watch the recording later. Or if your job changes hours and you're no longer able to make it on time, uh, make it in person, uh, you can. Uh, watch it online uh, live, or you can watch it after the fact. So it's, it's meant to be flexible to give you uh, every opportunity to view the course material. Now, because we only have lecture once a week, there's also a portion of the material that's available online. So it's sort of like a cross between a in-person class and a web class. So that's why they call it blended. All right. Um, this is the syllabus. Uh, this is the key thing about the syllabus right here, which I went over. Another thing is if you're having problems 
with your assignment. All right. Send me an email via Canvas. And in that me email, zip up all your files relevant to the pro uh, project and attach it to the message. Give me a complete and specific description of the issue, including screen captures if they're relevant. Do not upload assignments to the Dropbox unless it's ready to be graded. All right. Uh, here's what I get sometimes, you know, I'll get an email that will say my, my program doesn't work. And that's it. <laughs> maybe no, maybe not even any files. Or if there are files, doesn't work. Well, doesn't work covers a lot of turf, right? You know, uh, it takes me a little bit of time sometimes to go in and see specifically, especially on larger projects, exactly what they mean by doesn't work. So be as specific as, as possible uh, and include uh, all your files. Uh, you know, doesn't work isn't specific. Uh, maybe something like uh, this program. I'm, I'm just thinking of an example assignment in this class. Uh, this program calculates tuition correctly for students in the one to 12 credit hour range, but doesn't calculate correctly for 13 and above or something like that. That would be an example of a specific message because then I can look at it. I can look and exactly see, I can re recreate the error very easily and I don't have to spend a lot of time to it. The other thing is don't upload assignments to the Dropbox unless it's ready to be graded. So I know a lot of students, very conscientious, want to turn something in on time and that's great and that's admirable. However, if you're working on the assignment and it doesn't work, send me an email. Don't upload to the Dropbox because I won't deduct if we if we're in communication about a particular problem. All right. The only time I deduct is if people don't give me any information and turn something in three weeks late. You know, then I didn't know what was going on. You know, I didn't uh, didn't know if they're struggling for help or just didn't feel like doing the assignment. I don't know any of those things. So if we're working on the assignment together and you're sending me questions and I'm sending you responses and we're going back and forth, don't feel like you absolutely have to turn it in on time. All right. Um, but again, stay in communication with me. Uh, if the problem is not with the material, but your personal circumstances, just give me a note that says, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm having, uh, I had a family emergency this week, so I won't be able to turn it in on time. That's fine. I don't need to know the details of it. Um, you divulge as much as you care to. You don't really need to give me, uh, you know, you don't have to give me a doctor's excuse or, uh, you know, give a detailed description of exactly what's going on. Just a heads up that says, hey, I realize I have an assignment due and I'm not getting it in. And there's a reason for this, and I'll get it in as soon as I can. Now, with this freedom comes responsibility, right? Because uh, an easy check to, to see if you're covering the material well and you're understanding the material is if you're getting the assignments in on time. And if it's just a one-off thing where you turn in one assignment late, that's no big deal, you know? If it becomes habitual where every assignment is a couple days late or uh, a week late or whatever, uh, that's something that we probably need to address. And maybe you just need to spend more time on it. Maybe you have questions that need to be answered. We can work together to try to get you back on track uh, in situations like that. Um, let's see anything else I want to say about that. I don't think so. Let's look through the syllabus. It's anticipated you'll have 15 assignments worth six points and one worth 10 points. That's 100 points. And your grade will simply be the total of your points, 90 through 100 and so on. If it doesn't end up that we have 
points. On occasion, I will, you know, I'll screw up and we'll, you know, maybe we're catching up on some material, so I won't have an assignment this week. Your grade is a, uh, is whatever the percentage is of your total points. So if we only have 90 points and you get 80, it would be 80 divided by 90, whatever that turns out to be. Here's the schedule. We, there is no textbook in this class. Uh, materials are online. It's approximately what we'll be covering uh, over. I should change week 15, though. Real time edits to the to the syllabus. To get into database interactivity about this week, I think. All right. If you have any questions at all, if this just didn't make sense to you about the way the high flex works or anything like that. Uh, let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. It's on a week by week basis as well. You don't have to decide that you're always going to watch the video or that you're always going to come to class or whatever. Um, there's certainly advantages to doing it each way. You know, there's an advantage of coming in in person. There's advantages to watching it uh, at home via WebEx. There's advantages to watching it uh, on the video later on. And, you know, part of your job or responsibility is figuring out what works best for you and, and taking into account um, your total situation, not just academics. All right. Material in this class is separated into modules. All right. I sort of covered all this. Read this first. Blended class lecture information talks about pretty much what I've gone over. Link to the virtual classroom is somehow a problem. Oh, no, it's not a problem. You have to click on that. Yeah. And that will just connect me to myself, which probably will make the computer explode. So I'll say cancel. Generally speaking, there'll be one. Uh, there's a module per week. Uh, sometimes a module covers two weeks, so uh, maybe three in some cases, but like this module is weeks three and four. There'll be typically a to do this week list of the stuff that I want you to go over. It's a very important link. Class info that sort of sets your expectations for me. Uh, I'm very committed to return uh, to, to to grading things within a week of when they are turned in. All right, that's my goal. Now, there's times when I fall behind and I don't achieve my goal, but just as I'm very understanding of you when you turn in a late assignment, I, I hope I get the same courtesy in your understanding of me if I if I fall a little bit behind. Uh, I aim to review and respond to the email uh, once a day, uh, Monday through Friday. Now, I probably will also check on the weekend, all right? But I'm not committing to that, all right? Um, just, you know, if for whatever reason I have a busy weekend or um, I'm, I'm tired and I want to relax or whatever, uh, I reserve the right not to check my email over the weekend, uh, even though I probably will. <laughs> uh, if I don't respond to an email, all right, and a day or so has passed, feel free to send a nudge to tell me, hey, you, you know, I asked you this on Monday, here it is Thursday, or here it is Wednesday, and I haven't heard back from you. Because it's like anyone else, you know, I, I, I miss things. Uh, that's, you know, uh, your best bet is to send it through Canvas, by the way, through Canvas email, because that is isolated to being just student questions. So I don't get all the spam from 
other departments and for your information stuff that I'm not really interested in uh, that just sort of obscure the emails that I really do need to respond to. I talked about office lines. I talked about problems on the assignment. There is a discussion forum and feel free to post questions there. And that's about it. Do read these on your own to sort of reinforce it. Reinforce it. Fair use guidelines. This relates to if you're going to use images uh, or quotes or something from other websites. You're allowed to do that because this is an educational context, but limit yourself and show your sources. So if you used a picture from the Cleveland Browns website, just put a note on the bottom of your page, images from Cleveland Browns website. This goes into more detail about that. Okay, let's get into the more depth into the actual content of this class. If any of you have ever been to a musical, a lot of times at the very beginning of a musical, they have the overture. And the overture starts things off, which we're starting things off today. And the overture contains a little bit, maybe little snippets of all the main songs in the musical. You know, it's a way to sort of introduce those things to you. And so consider this to being the overture of this class. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, as the name implies, we're going to talk about uh, client side and server side scripting. And this is, I believe, a video. Yeah, watch this. Oh, the video, the audio actually works. I don't think it worked last semester. Uh, but watch that video because I'm going to cover this, but sometimes it's good to get additional perspectives. So, scripting in the client-server environment. Well, the first thing I think is necessary for us to define is what do I mean by the client-server environment? Well, Is all regular pain. Or you, I mainly use the Mac, so I'm not real familiar with a lot of these Windows things. Now let's go with paint. Okay. In a web environment, we have clients and servers. All right. Clients are the entities that are making requests for content, for web content. So if you're sitting at a computer browsing the web and you go and you type in the address of a web, a website, or you click a link or anything like that, you are the client because you are making requests. You make a request. Now those requests go through the internet, which is typically drawn as a cloud, which means that we're not concerned exactly how it gets, at least in this class. If you're studying networking, you're probably interested in how it gets from point A to point B. But for this class, we're not interested in that. We just trust that our request will make it to the proper web server. And what is a web server? A web server responds to requests made by clients. Specific kinds of requests, that is. Because there's more than one kind of server. Web servers handle requests for web pages and web content. So we have a diagram that I'll probably repeat a bunch of times. Whereas a client makes a request and 
the server sends a response to the client. Now, some of you have taken CI, I think probably all of you have taken CISS 216, where we dealt with static pages. What do I mean by mostly static pages? What do I mean by static pages? Static pages are pages that are unchanging or nearly completely unchanging. A plain old HTML page, in other words, with CSS would be an example of a static page. If you were to go into your thumb drive for CISS 216 and open lab one, it would probably look exactly the same today as it did when you turned it in. It's static, it's not changing, all right? So in the case of static pages, all the web server does is it finds the web page that you that was asked for and sends it back through the internet to the client. And the client gets a package that contains HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, along with other stuff, images, and so on, audio files, and so on. That's for a static web page. This would be kind of like if you go into uh, uh, McDonald's or Burger King and order, you know, order a burger. You know, they have a big bin of burgers that they go and pull the burger out of and just give it to you. So a request will at least contain the web page that you want to view. It can contain other things as well. In fact, it does contain other things. It contains your IP address, which can be used to uh, determine uh, a location uh, or an approximate location of where you're at. Uh, it can send the platform that you're working on. So whether you're on a mobile device, uh, Windows, uh, Mac, or, or whatever. It can contain data that you enter into a form. So you go to log into Canvas, you type in your username and password. That information is set to the, the Canvas web server to decide whether you are uh, able to log on or not. I'm getting ahead of myself, all right? This is a client server environment. Client makes requests, web server satisfies and responds to those requests by sending back this. Where does the scripting involve? What does scripting mean? Scripting is programming. Now, HTML isn't really a programming language. Sometimes people list it that way, but I wouldn't consider it that way. Why not? Well, because with HTML, you get pages that are unchanging. There's not conditional processing in HTML. In other words, there's not like something like, well, uh, if you uh, enter your information and you're a valid user, Go to the home page if you're an invalid user display an error message that's what i mean by conditional processing sometimes you do this sometimes you do that all right that kind of thing doesn't happen in static html pages it looks the same no matter what all right calculations would be another example of something that uh html can't do so if you wanted a little form to calculate converting Fahrenheit to centigrade, couldn't do that in plain old HTML, all right? Because doing calculations requires a programming language. Interacting with a database is something that static HTML can't do, right? Uh, repetitive operations, in other words, do something a certain number of times is something that HTML can't do. These require more full-fledged programming languages 
And when you hear the word scripting, think programming. A lot of times scripting you think of as like small programs, but just equate it with programming. So there's programming both on the client and on the server. And that's what we're going to study in this class. First, we're going to study the client side, and then we're going to study the server side. All right. If you have a choice of doing something on the client or server side, though, you need to understand how each of them work to decide what's the appropriate tool to use. So let's talk about what kind of things are good for client-side scripting. Client-side scripting has the advantage of being able to change an existing web page without questing. Put an asterisk next to that because when we study AJAX, we will do a little bit of requesting. Yes. Is, does there need to be a uh, additional even with the HTML? For example, you being a teacher, us being students and stuff that we can see. That may affect the way the HTML looks, but that code, that condition is not in the HTML. That would be in the server side language that produces the HTML. Right. We'll get we'll get on the server side scripting in a minute here. Uh, so client-side scripting is responsible for changing an existing web page without requesting a complete new web page. So here's an example I always is well we can go no further than Learning Community College's website. And this is a classic example that I use this mouse over menu all right this for that matter this sort of slideshow that runs or that you can scroll through these are all examples of things that happen on the client side Now, what kind of things can happen on the client side is things that change the page without reloading the page. So when we put our mouse over this, the page doesn't reload. Uh, this is where slow internet connections were actually better than fast internet collections, uh, connections for demonstrating. Because when a page refreshes, you notice there's a little blank, all right? Yeah, when we do this mouse over, there is no blink. So we're not refreshing that page. We're not going to the server and getting a new copy of the page when we do that. We're taking that page that was already been loaded and we're changing something about it. All right. That's an example of client side scripting. When we click on this, we're not refreshing the page and displaying a new little piece of information here. We're just changing what appears in this segment of the page without refreshing the entire page. So that is, again, changing an existing page without, requ without requesting a new page from the server. That's client-side scripting. So typical use of client-side scripting are things like a mouse over effect mouse over effect to display a menu. That doesn't require a, a page refresh. You don't have to go and ask the server for a new page with this menu being displayed. 
You simply have a little piece of code that goes and changes the visibility of submenu and make it visible instead of having it invisible. Uh, another example, and let me see if I can find example of this. W3 schools just to have an example. W3 schools is a good website to just start out looking things. It's not the be all end all, but it's a nice resource. So here's an example. I go and I've, let's say I don't type my name in, I just hit submit. I get an error. All right. Now, you kind of have to take my word for it, but the server was not, a request wasn't made to validate that and display that error. All that happened on the page that was already loaded. Right. So the server didn't return that error, the client did. And validation is a special case because there's reasons for doing validation both on the client side and the server side. The client side offers the benefit of immediacy, immediate, um, immediateness, immediacy, uh, getting tongue tied this first day here. It's immediate, all right? In other words, when we put our mouse over this, boom, it happens instantly. When we go and we press submit to send this data to a server, boom, we get the error immediately. That's the chief advantage of client side serving, serve, uh, client side scripting, is it's immediate. Because with fast internet connections, again, it's a little less obvious than it was in the good old days. All right, I should say the bad old days. But this trip of going through the internet, accessing a web server and getting a response back takes a lot longer than the client simply executing the code. Client side scripting is executed by the browser. The browser executes the JavaScript and that happens immediately, very, 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 very quickly, compared to sending requests through the internet and getting a response back. So anything that we can do and client-side scripting will have the advantage of the immediacy. Well then, why don't we use client-side scripting for everything, you might wonder. Well, in order for this to work, you need to send HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to the client. So let's say we were doing a quiz. And we would have a choice of where of grading it. Do we grade it on the client side or do we grade it on the server side? If we were to grade the quiz on the client side, we'd have to send the code that graded that quiz along with the HTML and CSS, which means effectively we'd have to send the answers to the client. And, the cli and a, a smart student could view page source, scan through the code and pick out the answers. So we don't do, we won't use client side when there's sort of a security issue. The example you brought up a minute ago, 
about logging on to Canvas, uh, determining whether you're a student or a uh, instructor, or even first of all, uh, verifying that you're a legal user, that you're a valid user. You wouldn't want to do that client side because that would involve the, the validation occurring on the client side, which means you'd have to send the password to the client side, which is not a good idea because, again, you could someone could look at the code and see the password. And even if they weren't a legitimate user, could then use that password to log on. So the validation of a password or the or grading of a quiz would probably happen or would happen, no probably to it, on the server side because of security issues. Anything that you wanted to keep that was proprietary to your organization of like uh, business rules for your organization, how things are calculated, all right? You would want to do on the server side because you wouldn't necessarily want to show users how you do a particular calculation or something. Right? Second big thing is database access. That's a little bit in the security, but it's also that the client doesn't have the tools to access, and it would be a bad idea, even if they had the tools, to allow the client to access your organization's database. You want control of that operation, and therefore you don't want that operation appearing just on anyone's machine. You want it to appear only on your web server because of control. Things that are very tightly controlled, you would want to have happen on the server side. Now, what's the purpose of server-side scripting? The purpose of server-side scripting is to generate HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, because that's what web servers do, right? The difference is, is the generation of that CSS, uh, JavaScript, and HTML is done dynamically, not statically. What do I mean? Your homepage in Canvas, let's say. It shows you the courses that you're enrolled in, and it shows you the courses uh, using the role that you uh, are performing in that course. In other words, if you're in this class as a student, you'll get the student view of CISS 232. You won't get the instructor view. How does that happen? Well, you log in, you put in a request. That request is gonna include your username and password. That web server is gonna look at that request, go to the database, make sure that you're a valid user, first of all, retrieve the courses that you're taking, retrieve the role that you perform in those courses, and it will dynamically on the fly create an HTML, CSS, and JavaScript page that corresponds to the courses that you're taking and the roles that you're performing. Likewise, if I log in, I supply my credentials and validates that I'm a user, all right, a valid user, we'll go to the database and look at the courses that I'm teaching and look to see if I'm a student or an instructor, and it will give me different options if I am a student or an instructor. Because, hey, I could be a student in another course, right? I could be taking a course here, so it's on a course-by-course -course basis, or you could be teaching a course, all right? So it's on a course-by-course -course basis. So two different roles. Client primarily is interested in changing an existing web page, whereas the uh, server-side scripting is responsible for creating on the fly new web pages. So let's think of 
some more examples of that. We go to Google. We Google JavaScript. And we get a list of links related to JavaScript. That page was generated just for us, all right, by Google looking through its algorithm, using the term that we submitted, that is JavaScript, and developing and displaying a web page that corresponds to it. To another test, Italian restaurants. Notice it shows us this web page was made just for us, right? On the fly. First result is the best Italian restaurants in Illyria. You think if someone in New York City did the same query, they'd get the best restaurants in Illyria? Of course not. They even give you a little map. Interesting thing is, notice I even said to block the location, and it still is able to do that because part of your request that gets sent is your IP address, and the web server can use that to get an approximate location of where you are. It was actually asking for a precise location where it would know that I'm sitting here in the business building at Lorraine Community College. Here it just knows that I'm in the, the Illyria area. So this page, in other words, was created just for me. Taking the information, taking all the information in my request, which again includes information I've entered into a form information about my location, information about my platform. Now, that's probably not relevant, so that's probably not considered when I'm searching for Italian restaurants. But if I was searching for image editing software, it probably does include mainly Windows things. It I, I would guess that it takes that into account. I can't guarantee it, but I would think that it would take into account the platform I'm in. So the two roles, changing a web page and creating a web page. Here is a introduction to JavaScript uh, set of video. Again, things that you can review uh, as part of the online portion of this class. W3 Schools JavaScript tutorial. I do want to go over a quick example, which is probably very similar to one of the examples we did in CISS 216. We have a page, put mouse over, it appears, doesn't do anything if I take it out. Let's spend a minute looking at this code and discovering sort of the what would I say, model? The pattern that most JavaScript's going to do. Most JavaScript is sort of a way for 
a way to manipulate the HTML and CSS properties based on user events. So in this case, on the link, we have a, an on mouse over event. Notice the sub menu is always there. It's in the HTML. And if we were to view the source, we would see that HTML is there. It's not displayed though. Why is it not displayed? It's not displayed because the style for it, style for the div is set to display of none. So we have the HTML and CSS working together. To include this HTML snippet, but make it invisible. Then finally, we have when the user places their mouse over that link, we're going to change things. We're going to find the thing on the page that has an ID of submenu. We're going to change its style, to change its display property to block. Now, this is very similar to the examples we went over in CISS 216. I just wanted to reintroduce the, the pattern of HTML and CSS defining the way the page initially looks, user events defined to change the way the page looks, and doing that by using what's called the DOM, document object model, to find the thing on the page that we want to change and set it to a new value. We'll pick up with more JavaScript examples next time. Are there any questions? All right. Uh, again, lab is immediately following this up in uh, BU 210. Uh, you're not required to go to the lab. You also are welcome to connect to the lab. If you're not in the lecture, you can connect to it online via WebEx. So I'll either see you up in lab or we'll see you next week.